So welcome to this event titled Youth in Capacity Building, the role of youth and their capacities in enhancing resilience for NDC implementation and for national development plans. My name is Alejandro Kilpatrick. I am the manager of the Capacity Building Subdivision at the Climate Change Secretariat and we support directly the work of the Paris Committee on Capacity Building, one of the committees established under the, the, the Convention and the Paris Agreement, in this case to, um, to support the work on capacity building under the Paris Agreement. Uh, this me, uh, MENA event is the last part of our series entitled Youth in Capacity Building, which has consisted of a series of events within each of the regional climate weeks of last year held in Africa, Latin America and Asia Pacific. These events have promoted the role of young people both as capacity builders, but also as recipients of capacity building in terms to better address climate change. The goal of our session here is to provide a platform for regional dialogue to promote effective resilience building amongst young people at local, national and regional levels in the MENA region. It will also explore and promote the role of MENA youth in building community resilience to climate change impacts through capacity building. This event will begin with a panel discussion followed by a brief project presentation from one of our partners and finally an open Q&A session. Hopefully we will have enough time to hear from, from our audience. So you'll hear a lot the word capacity building in this event because that's the main focus and particularly how youth uh, are uh, an act and a player, an important player in as not only as a recipient, but also as a provider of capacity building in different forms. So now um, uh, we will move to our panel discussion and it's a real pleasure for me to introduce our distinguished panel made up of experts, youth activists uh, and practitioners from the MENA region. So I would like to introduce and ask uh, to come to come to the to the um, front, uh, Neshad Shafi. I think he's uh, uh, Neshad. Yeah. Ah, great. I will be waiting for you, Neshad Shafi, who's the co-founder and executive director of the Arab Youth Climate Movement from Qatar. Then we have Abdallah Al Shamali, program manager from the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung Institute from Jordan. Pardon me if I mispronounce your names, but uh, I'm from Mexico, so they're not so familiar with, with these names. Pardon. Sara Alhartai, Hartai, Business Development Manager from ACW Power Saudi, from Saudi Arabia, and Aisha al Remaiti, Deputy Manager, Innovation Ecosystems, Dubai Electricity and Water Authority from our host uh, country, the UAE. We have uh, distinguished panels, panelists, thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure uh, and also to have a uh, very well gender balanced panel. So that's appreciated. And um, we have four questions for you today and they're easy questions, I would say. Uh, so, and we would like to have a fluid discussion. So we'd like to ask you to be brief in your answers because one question leads to the other, so you don't need to answer all of them at the same time, so we'll start question by question. So the first one is, what are your thoughts about, are youth capacity builders or recipients, or both? So I'll start with um, Aisha. First, I'd like to thank you for hosting us here um, in this session. And um, I believe that, um, as you also already mentioned, that youth are both, um, uh, they are part of the capacity building process as well they are recipients of the capacity building process. Um, main reasons for, for that, first, how are they capacity builders? Um, I believe youth are very versatile in what they do currently. Uh, before the notion was in, in terms of knowledge that people would only be in one track specifically. Uh, but now we can see youth being uh, being engineers and being um, advocates for businesses or economy. And this is the way forward um, to have knowledge branched out in different, uh, let's say, uh, sectors or sections. And they are always proactive, so, so this is how they are part of the capacity building process. Now, how, how are they the recipients? 
um, they are the recipients um, of the capacity building process because um, youth have a learning curve and um, the learning curve keeps on going uh, on and on even um, through different uh, stops in life, let's say. So this is how they are recipients and they are actually the best type of recipients, let's say, uh, in the capacity building process because they would be able to gain the knowledge, turn it into a belief and then turn it into a behavior uh, that they can live by. Thank you very much, Aisha. And so same question, but maybe now from for Abdallah. Thank you. Um, well, I would say that in, in any cause you want, uh, we're talking about sustainability a lot, and uh, we need to think also for the sustainability of the actors in any cause. And um, the sustainability of uh, the climate movement would be in always ensuring that there's more people coming in and, and more people participating um, to make it big. And this is, of course, where we you can invest in um, capacity building for youth, um, not just to uh, participate, but also to be uh, maybe leaders and, um, and and affect others uh, through inspiration and 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 through uh, leading by example. And it's it's very um, it, it's it's a thing also like with youth, you know, like how they um, look into fashion or thing. They see their peers, what they're doing, and then um, and and they think that that's interesting. And I think that's this is how they can be. Um, capacity build is not necessarily by their intention, but it also be a, a side effect of whatever we're doing. We just, um, yeah, so they definitely receive and uh, and, and a byproduct they also, uh, yeah, get. Yeah, thank you, Abdel. I think you, you that's an interesting point. So they're in a way being um, a, a model for other youth and uh, in, in certain aspect building those particular capacities. So thank you. Uh, Sarah, what do you think? Um, so basically, um, I just want to take it to an application perspective. Nowadays, who's doing the knowledge dissemination? Who's doing the capacity building for youth? Let's be honest and frank, governments are not. Because at least in the MENA region, they're not taking the responsibility of trying to raise awareness amongst youth because there is still this disconnect, this intergenerational disconnect between the olders and the youngers. I think what's happening on ground is quite fascinating because you see so many initiatives, youth born, youth led, to help other youth understand what's happening and not the other youth, the young kids who are currently in schools to teach them, to support them, to make them recognize what's the issue and what's the climate change crisis. So honestly, I think youth have stepped up to the game and they're no longer becoming recipients. They're taking the knowledge from the internet. They're taking the knowledge from all the open sources and they're trying to create their own experiences and try to disseminate it to other youth. So I would say youth, youth are leaders in the capacity building process. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So we went from recipients to providers to leaders. So thank you. Uh, Nishad. Uh, I will very much agree with Sarah because uh, youth have already stepped in onto capacity building. I think they are, they used to be a recipient, but in terms of climate education and, and uh, sustainability issues, I think uh, more and more young people are becoming capacity builder through knowledge they gain from attending conferences, reading a lot of documents, and they understand the Article 6 of climate education and adaptation. All those things, they took an initiative to learn themselves and educate the community, school or family. So in a way, I would say they are more capacity builder now and recipient. But the one who are doing now didn't have the same opportunity some years back. So it took its own time to be on that space. But now I think there's a moral obligation by our respective governments to take up their lead, provide them the infrastructure, make it more easier norm to get this thing done. So I believe like Sarah that young people are leader and their capacity builder than recipient. No, thank you. Thank you, Nisha and our, our distinguished panelists. So we got, uh, I think, a clear answer for the for the first question. Is that transition for only being passive uh, receivers of capacity building to being empowered to lead capacity building efforts? Thank you. So let, let's move to the to the second question which is, and I think, Sarah, maybe you already touched upon a bit on that, but what is the status quo of youth engagement in the MENA region? So again, let's start. 
Um, speaking from, from experience, let's say um, it's right, governments are leading the way uh, and are still not fully there, but uh, in the MENA region, let's speak about uh, the UAE as an example uh, of having the youngest minister appointed at the age of 22 as the Minister of Youth in 2016. And uh, we've heard uh, the past two days in the World Government Summit that upon this de decision, a lot of countries have actually appointed ministers of youth. So someone had to st take the step forward and then others would follow because this is defying, let's say, the status quo or the, or the norm. Uh, but then uh, not only that, not only uh, that a minister was appointed, then the branching happened. Of course, you need um, different hands to touch upon the public and the private sectors. So then came the notion of the youth councils in 2017 on the uh, government uh, level, let's say, of the seven emirates, and then on an organizational uh, level. So being uh, part of uh, speaking from DIWA, Dubai Electricity and Water Authority, um, the president of DIWA Youth Council, um, I've been working with a team of almost 20 youth uh, to serve uh, almost 4,000 youth of, of DIWA um, in different uh, parts. Now, what is the function these youth councils do? It's not only to serve uh, the youth in topics of their interest, but it's also uh, to create the sense of transparency that our government uh, is leading here in uh, the MENA region. Um, the sense of transparency that actually the level, uh, level of hierarchy is not always rigid, it's not always vertical. It can be more, uh, more flat, more lateral. And this is, uh, I believe, a clear example of that. So, um, the status quo, um, I believe, we're getting there, and um, and the UAE is creating a clear example uh, of the way forward and inspiring others through these different uh, stories. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Aisha. Thank you for for um, uh, telling us a bit how to shift to from the traditional status quo to examples like the councils. Thank you very much, Abdallah. Um, well, okay. Um, I think that um, from what I see, and this is my, of course, my my view, that it's still at minimal. Uh, I see is the um, MENA youth participation in comparison, of course, to other regions, and that's unfortunate. Uh, but of course, this is uh, being reflected by maybe uh, other factors. Um, some statistics show that the MENA youth, um, more than 25% um, face uh, like big problems of unemployment. They have problems into uh, starting their uh, economic lives. And and then, that, I mean, this is a burden uh, in case anyone even have had their interest or they were environmentalist, environmentalist they can't uh, pursue um, their, um, their goals or what they want to participate in this cause because they had to go and work full time in other jobs. And um, so I, I think um, there's many factors play in, in general. Um, and uh, definitely we can still improve a lot. Um, and, and, and when I see also the usually the age of youth involved even is a bit higher than youth in different regions. Um, um, I see maybe like people who are already about to graduate university or after that they start to be um, really involved in the, in the in the climate action, but in in different regions they can be much much younger. Um, it it shows maybe also like how the way the communicated uh, the way climate the crisis was communicated to them and also in in, in the presence. Um, so we we still have to go away um, into include more youth. No, thanks, Abdallah. Interesting that you mentioned that the age differentiation and compared to other regions, that's an interesting particularity for MENA. Uh, Sarah, please. So um, the question is, what's the status quo for MENA, uh, climate, MENA youth in climate um, action? I think um, I would like to address this question from two layers. The first layer, how are we seeing um, MENA youth? represented in international negotiations in UNFCCC process through being part of the uh, climate action, um, 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 let's say, um, the, the international climate action work. And on a local level, what's happening on a local level? What are youth are doing on a local level? So I'll start with the first part. I've attended so far two climate negotiations or two climate cops, uh, the one in Madrid and the one in Glasgow. and. It was quite saddening to see that the participation of MENA youth is there, but it's not up to the ambitions. You see 
many communities and many uh, minorities are represented in the climate negotiations from youth perspective, but you don't see that. You see the global North youth are there, the global South youth are not there. And the question is why they're not. There is no enough funding, there is no enough support, be it, be it from the private sector or from the decision makers, they're not there. So now let's look at the local level. And it is important to be in these uh, in these settings because being there just help you to move from being someone who understand about climate to someone who talks the climate language, because it is it is not only an environmental issue, it's a political issue as well. Now on a local level, I've been lucky to know Nashad who started something in Qatar. I've been lucky to know Abdullah who started something in, uh, in, in Jordan, uh, but are there enough youth activists on ground from the MENA region? The reality is not. If they are, were you able to see all of them here, represented from all the GCC countries, from all the MENA countries? Are they, be, are they there? Are they doing something? And although there is enough environmental education in schools, but it's not a climate education. That's the reality. So I don't see that there is enough, um, let's say, climate activism. I'm not saying it's not there. It's just I don't believe it is enough to be able to turn into an advocacy for the government to tell them that we are the youth of our nations and we want to see change in our countries. We want to change the way that you're drafting all of these policies. We want to see a change in the way that you're drafting the NDC process. Are youth included in the NDC process in terms of drafting these NDCs? Are they participatory or are they even targeted in these NDCs? In a recent analysis I did with Care About Climate about Saudi Arabia NDC and some other regions NDCs within the MENA, the reality, there is no even mention of youth. Honestly, UAE was an exception because they had youth centered in their NDC, but in other regions it's not. And that's, that's, um, that's something that we would like to see change in the coming years. No, thanks, Sarah. And I think you raised an interesting point about talking the climate language. So it's it's, it's one thing to un, to understand the the technical aspects of what is climate change, etc. But also, what are the the linkages also with with development, with uh, economic and social development, uh, post recovery. Now that everyone's talking about post COVID nineteen recovery. You know? So thank you so much for that, Nishad. Over to you. I will take from where Sarah stopped. Um, why aren't there so many uh, youth-led solutions or youth-led activism or awareness, but it's a structural issue. Like she mentioned, two examples, like the Jordan Initiative, Katarina. how many such youth-led initiative which can be registered and functional organization. So as an individual, you cannot just accept fund and travel to summits. There should be an institution who does credible work on ground who can be funded either by national organization or international agencies telling that I want to see your work at the international level. So that can be advocacy work, awareness work, policy work with your respective governments. So that has to be changed. That That is the issue. If that's structural or the platform is not ready, you will be underrepresented. So we cannot be part of all the time with the coalition of the government because uh, then we have to speak the language of the government. So just to have that independence, we don't have too many platforms to be. Because of lack of that platform, the number is low. She mentioned two COPs. I've been seeing, I'm seeing still COP21. Mm. Number was zero when I attended first COP back in COP21 when we had this historic Paris mm. Agreement signing. There was nil. So again, going back to the structure that has not changed. So, but it became a so tokenism, like government do take young people in a way of showing their thing, but how good they are working within that system is still a big question mark. I think there need to be more space for youth-led organization to function in very ground level projects and stuff where government supporting them, private sector, property, but give that freedom to flex their arms and let them stay independent. I mean, they are not, they are very critical on issues which are non-political, but they are critical on issues where youth voices has to be heard. So it's not always that young people voices are political in this region, but they are coming with solution based idea data-driven uh, advocacy and awareness program. So this has to be supported from a very structural point of view. I think that structure is not yet there. Um, that's a big failure. That's why our young people are outnumbered by our global north. Mm -hmm. And it seems unfortunate. People see climate, the global north would save the world, which is very wrong. Uh, I think it's a collective effort. And um, 
if the representation is not there, it's always an issue. So it seems like um, people keep asking, like she mentioned, where is Greater Thunberg of uh, Arab world or Middle East? There are hundreds of greater, yeah. but our media and the so-called white global north only want few creators in Sweden. <laughs> so <laughs> unfortunately, that, that's a structural issue, yeah. how the system politically works, how the media politically works. So that's what I just wanted to highlight. So, yeah. No, thank you very much. I think very, very valuable insights on, on these uh, structural issues and platform or lack of enough platforms issues. So I think that lead, leads uh, well into our next set of questions, which are maybe more on what you were mentioning, uh, Nisha, on the, the, the youth-driven solutions. So the question is, what is the role, in your view, of MINA youth in building resilience? And maybe let me start the other way around this time. So let's start with Nisha, and then we... Okay, so I'll go back to the question number one, how young people took up the capacity building program of their own. Of course, when you understand the topic, like what uh, Sarah mentioned, you need, first of all, people who understand the whole climate uh, narratives, what are the uh, article talking about, and the, the least, what is your country's stake in those? Mm. You just cannot be uh, you know, blend in and post something, climate action, climate action doesn't work. You need to know what is your country's stake. If your country is uh, in the Gulf, you need to see what are your country's pathways towards decarbonization, how is your country building the knowledge economy, are their commitment are transparent enough? Like, are the young people part of the NDC discussion? Even if they are, what are their demands even heard? Like she mentioned, only UAE has that. So it is, it can be resonated. It's a good example to ask your respective government to follow the suit. So this can be done. I think as a youth organization of ours back in Qatar, uh, we started to build the capacity building to young people through our programs like Household Carbon Footprint Initiative, uh, Qatar Environmental Champions Project, uh, Eco Literacy for Imams, and we also now working on a decarbonization pathway for Qatar. These are the projects where we are bringing young people not only the knowledge, but also ideas of how you can look into the, some of the two topics which people keep hearing, but still I think it's a nascent age, many don't understand what is mitigation and adaptation. So in a way, we are trying to build at a school level, which is like the ideal age to work on, to understand what a climate change uh, is all about, what is adaptation, what is resilience means in the mm -hmm. first way. So I think you can not just impose something on them and they gain understanding of climate change, rather bring some programs, can be educational programs, activity-based programs, but targets young people at schools and universities. I know some of the time whenever we went to schools, we always get like, they are busy in studies. So there's a big problem, like she mentioned. Our environment uh, subject is like the physical education class when our teacher says, yeah, I have one physical education class a week. Does that help your health? Yeah. No. Yeah. So it's the same with the climate education. You really have to change the, the syllabus, how it used to be. And uh, I don't know how many minister of education from our region signed the memorandum they had in uh, COP26 where the Minister of Education were asked to work with the Minister of Environment to translate environment issues to the schools and to work at the national level. So they will be stock taking at COP27 in uh, Sharm el Sheikh. So we'll see how's that working because we haven't seen that happening there in our country. So we'll be looking at seeing how that the things are working on. But our project is looking at the same thing. So we are not going to replace, but we are just going to facilitate how our organization can work on programs that can build resilience within the community by the community. Yeah. No, thank you very much uh, for that example. Um, Sarah, over to you. What's the role of MENA youth in building resilience? Um, definitely there is a role for them and there is a potential, but I would like to touch upon something Abdullah said. There is a huge number of unemployment in our region. Mm -hmm. I remember once reading, um, I'm part of the Global Shipper uh, community of the World Economic Forum, and I used to love reading, you know, the reports of what are the high risks of each and every region, and what are the challenges in the region. And unemployment was number two in our region. And I, I, I always wonder, how come we have so many challenges, so many opportunities, and the youth, who are the driver of finding these solutions and changing the status quo are not involved and they're unemployed. It's a huge untapped potential that is not being utilized. So is there a role? Yes. Are the challenges there? Yes. But 
our decision makers recognizing that we have this energy that is not being utilized to solve the issues of the um, of our countries. So I believe if we want to start with anything is ensuring that youth have platforms where they can channel their energy through the private sector and as well through the civil society, where in both feet they can do so much change instead of just staying at their homes. Yeah. No, thanks, Sarah. I think maybe just came to my mind the, the notion of, of green jobs, for example, no? and that's an, uh, an avenue for addressing those two issues, as maybe. So um, so now over to, um, now we're still in this question, so Abdallah, your views on this question. Yeah, um, well, <coughs> I would say, uh, of course, um, uh, not all youth can participate or can um, lead into the, let's say, building the resilience, because um, we can break down uh, whoever's youth involved in, in climate into maybe three main categories. First of all, the youth that unaware of the climate crisis, um, and then our role is to basically let them know. And I, I think it, it, this is a maybe the, the bigger percentage in the MENA region, and there's the people who do know, but um, and interested um, to participate, but don't have yet the means. Um, and, and then we have the young leaders, uh, the people who already went through, they know about the climate crisis, they have been in somehow uh, empowered to um, to lead an initiative. And I think these people who are um, really um, important uh, here, that we identify these people and then uh, work um, to uh, give them, first of all, the resources they need to create a rebel effect to attach or to, to bring on uh, other youth um, to the movement. Um, and but at the same time, not neglecting the other um, categories, which is basically the people who wants, still wants the resources to become young leaders, we support them into becoming more and then we need to uh, um, work to uh, communicate the climate crisis for the general public so we can get more people involved. No, thank you. So I, I guess it's the concept of um, champions and leaders no? in, in that sense. Aisha, your thoughts? So like uh, my colleague here, Abdullah, mentioned that we have these three types of, of youth, but they need a framework to work with. They need, um, if let's say the, the agile government, uh, that's not there, they will not be able to step foot step, especially in such a given time, be it the climate change agenda or be it any other agenda they're working on. Um, so it has to come from their governments to be more agile, more adaptable, spe specifically given the current circumstances. And we have seen a lot of uh, things that went well and went bad, and it has been very unpredictable uh, the last uh, two years, let's say. Um, I believe another point is, um, okay, youth can be there in the COP meetings. They can speak the climate uh, language. But, but what's the benefit if we do not localize these global goals, the SDGs or any other global goals, if I do not localize it into my given environment? Uh, specifically, let's say in the MENA region, um, and any d two different countries in the MENA region can have a different type, let's say, of localizing these um, based on their uh, policies, based on their rules and regulations. Uh, so I believe uh, localizing uh, the SDGs is uh, something that the youth should definitely uh, work on in their different regions uh, of the world. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you for, for bringing um, back um, the, the SDGs, localizing the SDGs, because again, we're talking about climate change being one of the SDGs, but it, it's about the implementation of all of them holistically. So thank you for that. So let's move to the, the last question of, of the panel. And is uh, let me start uh, this time with, with, with Sarah. So how can youth be effectively engaged in resilience planning in order to safeguard the NDCs and enhanced SDG action in the region. So I guess we already touched upon a bit of this, but if you can elaborate a bit more, that would be great. Um, in terms of planning, I think always planning goes to the main stakeholder, the, the government. So um, having youth part of the government, having youth councils definitely is effective. Um, uh, having seat at the table. So. 
once I, I got a question from a negotiator, a lead negotiator, and he told me, you guys are here, you're in the cops, and on what capacity you think we should be listening to you? You don't have a, you're not a, an entity that is recognized, and that was because I was younger. You're not an entity that is uh, that has a seat or that has a vote. If you don't have a vote, how can I help you? How can I listen to you? How can you have an, any impact? And that, that was the question that really, you know, um, made me think, if you do not have effective means of inclusion of youth, the picture of having a young person there is useless. If you do not, ha if this youth does not have a vote, does not have a say, is unable to consult, to advise, is not able to influence, it's just a picture. And there is no, there will be no impact. So I think in terms of planning, definitely having seat at the table, that is not only to be there, an imaginary seat, rather a seat where you can really influence and where you can really bring uh, youth perspectives um, into the planning process. Um, and again, this is on a government level, but grassroots movement is important. And these, what so many youth are doing now, and they're coming up with. Um, and we're hoping that this will not change the governments, but it will change the hearts of the people, the behaviors of the people. People will become more enlightened. They will understand the issue. They will feel the issue. Then this is where you can have a change from the bottom up. No, thanks, Sarah. And um, you said I like the, the phrase changing the hearts of people. So I think it's it's a behavior, it's a mindset type of of uh, transformation. Um, Abdallah, over to you. Um, well, I, I uh, would like to also continue maybe with the, uh, what I mentioned in the last uh, question is um, working on maybe different stages of youth and recognizing that there are different youth and different needs in different contexts. Um, so the champions and leaders, we need to um, um, yeah, enable them to create their own initiatives. And, um, and then we, for, for other youth, we need to communicate the climate crisis um, effectively to them. And I can't stress on communication enough, um, especially in this region, because we, it's not something that circulates in the news. It's not something that circulates in different channels. Um, so uh, communicating um, the um, uh, climate um, to to Arab youth is is really uh, important, um, and and that's by maybe selecting the the right channels, um, which through youth uh, through uh, through other youth who are already have um, established channels. Um, and I don't know if we have time, but um, um, there's a video I would like maybe to show that um, we, um, we we created in, uh, in the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung Regional Climate and Energy Project um, to talk to youth, but not through our usual channels. It's uh, through a travel blogger, and um, he's he's a bit famous in the region. And um, and then we, we, we contacted him and told him, like, hey, um, you have a lot of young followers, and we need to tap that. And so he created a, from his content and trying to connect with climate change, and it had a, a really great result. Uh, we had hundreds of thousands of views, and which he didn't expect. And then all of people said, coming interested. And these people would never be, um, um, yeah, would never acquire channels about climate change because it's not in their general interest. So they will not follow, but they follow other stuff. Um, so if you can please maybe play it, just we play it briefly. Um, no, thank you, Abdallah. It would be a pleasure to to see that as an example. سلام في بنما في مجموعة جزر اسمهم سان بلاس تقريبا زي المالديف بس على أرخص شوي هدول الجزر حلوين جدا لدرجة إنه طوكيو وريو بعد ما عملوا عملية أكبر سرقة في التاريخ راحوا على هذا المكان. Welcome to the San Blas. Welcome to the Isla Dog Island. Welcome. هاي الجزر بسكنها من 500 سنة تقريبا شعب اسمهم الكونة من السكان الأصليين لأمريكا الوسطى حجزت رحلة يومين على هدول الجزر تقريبا طلعت ب100 دولار شاملة كل شيء عشان أزورهم وأتعرف على هذا المكان يلا 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 لكن في مشكلة صغيرة إنه هاي الجزر عم تختفي لأنه زيها 
زي جزر المالديف زي دولة الكرباتي وكثير أماكن تانية في العالم اللي رح تغرق بسبب ارتفاع منسوب المياه بالعالم بسبب التغير المناخ تخيل إنه كل هاي الجزر اللي زي هيك رح تختفي تماما عن وجه الأرض تماما عن وجه الأرض اتمنى تحضروا هذا الفيديو لنهايته لانه موضوع okay, جدا um, مهم ما حياثر بس على الجزيره وانما اخرته ياثر علي وعليك yeah, زي ما انا سوري ذات اتس ذات نو ترانسليشن بس ذس از فور عرب تارجتد تو عرب بيبل سو ام يا اند ذن لايك اند ذن هي شوز ا ليتل بيت اوف ذا اوف ذا وات از غونا هابن اند لايك وذ كول افكتس اند ذن توكينج لايك ان نوت نيسيسيرلي ان ا فيرست شوكينج فيو بس اولسو تو اتراكت بيبل اند اتس لايك ا That this is a travel destination, and it's going to be this island is going to be affected, and, be, and it's going to be ground. And um, and then I think this is one of the ways that we can maybe effectively engage you through like proper communication. Uh, and then when we got pe enough people involved, we have a pool of people that we can actually call in to train them further, and to then they become uh, champions by themselves. No, thank you, thank you very much, Abdallah, for sharing this. I think even for someone who doesn't speak Arabic like me, you could understand the messages, no? because we're staying to the islands, the, the sea level rise, so you could understand it already. So I think it's very, very, very appealing. So back to our questions, and thanks for that, Abdullah. So uh, Nishad, uh, back to, to our question. Well, I mean, like Abdullah mentioned, communication is key, but uh, we we need to tap in the the knowledge of the the young people who graduate from the universities and mm. tap in with the solutions but like abdullah uh, mentioned there are a lot of unemployment like uh, sarah mentioned there are untapped resources most of them are engineers uh, it's not that just graduate with history or english as uh, their degrees so how can they tap in uh, well green jobs is uh, quite a fancy word but i don't know on the ground reality what it looks like for the region but uh, given the energy transition and decarbonization happening at a very fast rate in the region, obviously there are a lot of jobs going to come. And uh, then the big question comes in, are they prepared to take those jobs? So are our government training them on that aspect? These are, these are the way I think youth engagement can be made more government friendly than sort of activism oriented, which doesn't exactly work like a global north. So I think you need to be smart enough to work with the governments here, showcase that you have solutions uh, in a very progressive manner and things that young people are partner than sounding uh, anti-government sort of sentiments, which very much work in the global north. And you see on myself, you know, whenever I go out of the region, I do march with Greater Thunberg, but I cannot uh, march with Sarah in Jidda or Doha or in Abu Dhabi. <laughs> so here it's more like a diplomacy uh, and that quite well work. I mean, my experience within the Qatari ministerial delegation is the same. I used to represent uh, the cops. Representation also key. You go there, you learn, bring back to the community. That's how you use it. It's not just a, a token of going there and coming back and joining the cop uh, countries. But understanding those things, bringing back to your team and you, your team um, uh, decimate to your, uh, this, the community. And in a way, uh, it was always I used to go by, by, the, by, the, by the civil society organization. Then the country delegation realized this organization and the person has the credibility. Why don't you join our delegation now? So last two co-ops I've been attending with the Qatari delegation were hosting events at the pavilion. We had Abdullah himself talking about how Arab youth leading uh, uh, climate action in the region in, at the Madrid, I believe. So in a way, it becomes a friendly and a more on a diplomatic level. You engage them, they, they, then they find the, oh, there's some potential. They're well educated, they understand climate more than them. Because sometimes our young people are so involved in negotiation topics better than our uh, diplomats, frankly. I think they really need capacity building sometimes. But uh, I think that still those young people are not tapped into some of the jobs within the government. Uh, you, know, you can take them as a consultant to support the ministries. So there are a lot of avenues. I think uh, having a youth advisory group within the Ministry of Environment will be something that, you know, you tap in new diplomats for the country because one of the things with many of the ministries here in the region is that uh, continuity. Yeah. Either it is election or removal of the minister, uh, um, combining the ministry, dividing the ministry, the continuity is lost. But tapping in some young people at like very young age, like if they have the minister, you're taking out that ministerial things a long way. So that will help the country itself. So looking at those young people as a resource, 
rather than looking another way that, oh, this activism doesn't work. But I would like to also highlight our activists and activism in the region are better than anywhere else because our young people are with tons of knowledge. I haven't seen that in the global north. There it is only slogans. Frankly, I mean, I am not criticizing them, but I'm telling how much knowledgeable our young people in the region are. And so I think it, it can be used as a resourceful tools for our respective governments. No, thank you very much. And I think that you're talking about a, a dialogue that activism is important, but it's it goes beyond is the dialogue, the constructive dialogue with with government and others, and also the. I, I've seen some experiences in delegations. I cannot mention names where they they act they they go to youth as advisors for certain topics, for, particularly for mitigation topics, which sometimes, as you said, might not be well understood. Can I add one thing to that? I just want to take the conversation forward just one second. Sure. Um, it's interesting that he went to so many cops until there was this trust that needed to be built for him to go to the delegation. Why don't we trust our youth from the start? Why don't we trust that they are capable? They can be part of the solution. They can develop something. They can be with us. They're our allies, not our enemy. We're not, we're not looking at uh, striking at streets. That's not culturally we do it. But we're willing to work hand in hand in office, come and we draft and we continue together planning and the process. It's just that needs this little thing that is trust. No, thanks, Sarah. And I guess we're reaffirming the point that um, youth are capacity builders. So, but let's let's continue and finish this round of questions with Aisha. Please. Um, so the question was uh, addressing resilience planning. Let's say, and this was also a hot topic um, in the World Government Summit the past two days um, at the Expo site. Uh, so a lot of ministers were speaking um, at Wedges about um, to build resilient cities, you need a creative city. Again, this creative city has to be adaptable, has to be agile. And they talked a lot about uh, focusing on economic security, given the current changes, on food security, on energy security. So this is all just to entrust the three pillars of sustainability and reinforce uh, the SDGs in a local form. And as Sarah mentioned again, um, you can have a lot of activists, but if there is no belief in the community, you are not going to get anywhere. Uh, to induce these, let's say, habitual changes, to be a way of life, to be a behavior, um, not just something that's, uh, that's just for a moment and will go there. And you will see again this ripple effect uh, coming once you induce these habitual changes over a long uh, span of time, then you will be able to see it, to see the results. It's not a thing that you can see um, in a moment. And this again applies to everything in the world, let's say the climate agenda or any, any other agenda. No, thank you. Thank you for reinforcing all, the, all those points uh, about uh, changing mindset, behavior and, and working together, basically. So we reached the end of, of our panel. So thank you very much. Maybe a round of applause for our panelists. Brilliant, brilliant insights. And, uh, and, and you can sense the passion. And I think that's important also. Uh, so now I would like to pass the microphone to uh, uh, Sainaf Rakti, who's the program manager at the Mohammed VI Foundation for Environmental Protection in Morocco. And she will be delivering a, a very interesting presentation, and um, then we'll have the, uh, the chance for a Q&A with our audience and our panelists. So, you can help us with the slides, please. There you go. Thank you so much um, for this event and thank you for our dear panelists for or for this very inspiring discussion. I learned a lot from uh, different perspectives uh, and answering different questions really from uh, different regions. So from my end, I will be sharing with you two concrete uh, initiatives that the Mohammed VI Foundation for Environmental Protection is leading, mainly the African Green Universities and Youth Education Network and the African Youth Climate Hub. Uh, I will be starting with a, a brief presentation of the Mohammed VI Foundation for Environmental Protection that was established in June 2001 by at the initiative 
of His Majesty King Mohammed VI and Her Royal Highness uh, Princess Lala Hasna has been entrusted the effective presidency of the foundation from the beginning. So in this mission, uh, the foundation is open to the entire public, from school children uh, to political and economic decision makers to the general public to raise awareness uh, and education to sustainable development. So through education and advocacy, the foundation develops uh, awareness on environmental um, issues and prepares future generations to take charge of uh, preserving their living environment and to engage themselves permanently in the path of sustainable development. Uh, also in 2019, Royal Highness Princess Lala Hasna, President of the Foundation, uh, inaugurated the Hassan II International Center for Environmental Training to track the record of 20 years uh, dedicated to environmental awareness and education with the variety of programs that the Foundation has initiated uh, since its inception in 2001. So the center is entirely dedicated to raising environmental awareness and education among all target groups uh, children, civil society, youth, business, uh, administration, local government, uh, entities, and other relevant st stakeholders. Uh, in other words, I'd like to say that the center is here to strengthen uh, and increase the fundamental mission of the foundation to advance the ecological transition and try to make uh, its contribution in terms of awareness, information, and training in sustainable development. So the center is also a space for dialogue, pollination, and the development of the most appropriate skills, resources, and tools in favor of the education of environment and sustainable development. Now I will share with you the, uh, the two concrete initiatives, starting with the African Green Universities and Youth Education Network, uh, which is uh, which is a program that was designed and co-constructed with African universities uh, and putting forward the leadership role of universities to integrate uh, environmental, uh, for, um, environmental approaches and sustainable development. Uh, it was launched in March 2020, uh, 2021 in partnership with the United Nations Program uh, for Environment and it is based mainly uh, on three main pillars, um, training, education and networking. The network aims to promote the integration of environmental and sustainable development concerns into teaching, research, community engagement, and university management, while seeking to improve the skills of future generations. So the main mission of Aguyen uh, Network is to act as a sustainable leader for higher education and youth networks on the African continent and to promote the concept of uh, sustainable campuses. I want to share with you key numbers. Uh, up to today, we are 22 universities from eight African countries, including Morocco, Tunisia, uh, Mauritania, Senegal, Comoros, Islands, Ivory Coast, Kenya, and Uganda. And as part of this network, we were able to carry out uh, several capacity building workshops and webinars on topic, uh, topics related to the establishment of a sustainable campus on practices related to uh, the realization of composting at the university level, the valuation of water and energy through the application of sustainable solutions, the leadership role of universities in combating uh, climate change and other environmental issues. Through the, um, through the Aguilla network, six Moroccan country, uh, universities have been engaged into the, uh, uh, the Race to Zero campaign and signed for a climate plan to reach the net zero target by 2030 and thus to contribute to the uh, global ca carbon neutrality. Very briefly, some showcases of, uh, of, uh, of universities, starting with Ibn Tufail University, which is based in uh, Kenetra in Morocco. Uh, they, they succeed in, uh, in implementing um, different uh, innovative uh, practices, mainly uh, in photovoltaic, um, uh, photovoltaic benches, electromobility station, and LED, uh, LED lighting. And also we have the uh, uh, Strathmore University oops, Strathmore University that is based in Kenya, which is an uh, energy efficient um, uh, campus. The university produces um, and cater, caters for its own uh, electricity needs with excess power uh, that is held to the national grid under the, uh, uh, under, under the, um, the Kenya Power Network. 
and also Al Akhawan University in Ifran. Uh, in addition to its uh, its green campus, the university has developed and managed an uh, an innovative um, pilot unit for biodiesel production, starting from used frying oils in order to uh, sustainably self insure um, a part of its energy consumption. Also, um, okay, we now I will uh, share with you the uh, the second initiative, the African Youth Climate Hub. And within the same context, um, the African Youth Climate Hub is an initiative by youth and for youth that aims to be a positive space for exchange and uh, concrete support for young Africans, uh, both in terms of skills, knowledge, and, um, and entrepreneurship and job opportunities as well. It is an initiative that is piloted in, uh, in Africa. Uh, in Africa to deliver, to deliver um, immediate and concrete results with a view to scale up and partner with other uh, regions. The uh, African Youth Climate Hub is a partner, uh, is a formal uh, partnership with the uh, OCP, uh, the Mohammed VI Foundation for Environmental Protection, Yongu, and uh, University of Mohammed VI Polytechnic. Six models are, uh, are, have been uh, established to foster and support the youth uh, and intergeneration, intergenerational engagement. It is a network uh, to facilitate connections among youth and across generations. It's also an incubator uh, to provide concrete support to youth-led projects. Up to 10 projects have been uh, uh, incubated in the first, uh, in the first edition. It's a forum to celebrate and make visible youth stories, youth leadership and youth innovation, as well as identify and highlight uh, green job and training opportunities for, uh, for youth, including in the context of, uh, of just, uh, just transition. It is a knowledge center uh, to capture, develop, and disseminate co-constructed knowledge and an observatory also to celebrate and make visible youth voices youth uh, stories, youth leadership, and youth innovation across the continent, including the, in the context of, uh, of NDCs. It's also a dashboard uh, to collect and provide data on and for youth and uh, the important synergies between the 2030 Agenda and the 2063 Agenda. Uh, currently, the African Youth Climate Hub have launched an inner link class uh, which is uh, which is already online uh, in the platform a youth uh, youth climate hub that I invite you to uh, to access to uh, which is also available online within the platform and for free and access for everyone. Um, these are the two main initiatives that I wanted to share with you and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Saina, for for sharing these initiatives and. And, and demonstrated the, the value of youth engagement in, in influencing or, or, for example, in this case, greening campuses and provided platforms for you to, to exchange. So um, maybe if we can go back to the previous slides. And I'll ask my esteemed panelists to come back to, to, the, to the front to see, um, to ask any, uh, to answer any questions that might be from the audience. So um, any questions from audience, please. See first. Uh, thank you, Alejandro. Thank you for the panelists uh, for this interesting uh, subjects and discussion. Uh, my name is Haysam, Haysam Khawant. I'm coming from Lebanon. Uh, I'm uh, representing uh, Lebanon Eco Movement. Uh, and I would like to ask two questions. The first one for uh, Ms. Sara, and the second for anyone can answer that. Uh, Ms. Sara at the beginning was saying that uh, financially we are not supported, uh, even obviously our uh, governments are not doing so. So. Uh, uh, and uh, during my during this uh, conferences now, uh, all what we heard about financing is regarding transition for the businesses uh, on, in order to t make this transition and in order to keep uh, for the job employments and everything. Nothing about capacity building and nothing about youth. So uh, what, where do you think we have to get our uh, finance? How you get your finance now? How you are uh, you know, participating in the COPs? and everything you are doing, do you think that the private sector has to do so, or uh, it has to be through the international community from someone uh, in specific? Uh, and my second question uh, for anyone just to discuss uh, this. Sorry. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask that uh, 
uh, what do youth want, want to say and practice? What do, what do they want? Are they asking for the participation only? Do they think that youth in, this, in our area are not participating? They are asking only to participate, uh, only to, to give uh, their opinion, or they have something to say about the wrong practices is done. Do you think that the practices is, is now uh, is wrong? Uh, are our leaders are doing something wrong? We, 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 need, we need to say something for this, or it's only about participation, what we are looking for as, uh, as movements. Thank you so much. Thank you. Maybe we'll take a couple of questions, a first round, and then hand it over to a panelist. I think here. Um, well, hello, everyone. My name is Amel. I'm from City University of New York, research team on climate change. Um, as we know, researchers and scientists have been warning about climate change for decades, but the youth are the ones who had the courage to go out on the streets and protest about this matter. So how can we link the youth to experiences, funds, employment, because we are really struggling with this. Uh, we need experiences to get a job. We need a job to get an experience, and there is a loop about this. For an entry level job, you need five plus experience and master degree or a PhD, which you are either in your 30s or 40s, not to say that you're not young, but this is not about the youth anymore. So how can we solve this? Thank you. Great question so far. You're gonna have a tough time, but uh, I have here and... Yeah, thank you very much. Hello, I'm uh, Smail Forgia. Uh, from Morocco, um, I have one comment and one question. Uh, comment is related to the last question that has been asked about the NDCs and engaging young people. Uh, I think we are very privileged here as a group because uh, we are a bit knowledgeable about some of the aspects of climate change, but step number one is actually for young people to understand uh, what is climate change and to understand what they are, what are their NDCs in their countries' NDCs. So therefore we have to keep this mind as young people present here that we have this right to be present uh, in this international uh, dynamic that is happening, but we have also this duty to make the, the messages heard at the local level, bring them up and the other, the other way around, make people understand what, what is happening here. That's first thing. Second thing, I want to change a bit the, 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 the way of thinking and, and my question would be, related to some keywords I heard. I heard trust, I heard uh, also language, climate language. Uh, my question would be, uh, and it is also related to this aspect of uh, support, because when, by experience, when you want to attend some big uh, venues like these and would like support from either government or even private sector, the question they ask themselves first is how is this young man or woman controllable in terms of what they're gonna say? Uh, are we going, are we comfortable in actually funding this person or not? And that's what brings me to this climate language thing. Uh, how do you think us as young people need to adapt our behavior and adapt our way of doing in order to build this trust with all the stakeholders that are, would be willing to support us, not only in participating, but also in concretizing our ideas and making our projects uh, see the light. Thank you. Thank you again, a great question and comment. I think here, and if I don't see any questions, maybe I'll close the round and give the, our panelists a chance. Uh, my name is Aya Brahim. I'm a researcher on climate change policies from United Nations Economic and Social Commission for West Asia. Um, just one, I want to have one comment and one brief question. Uh, we hosted the 14th negotiation workshops for Arab negotiators uh, during the past two days. Um, and I was very happy to see a good a youth team, a very good youth team from both UAE and Saudi Arabia. And um, I want to ask you for advice how we can replicate this for other countries um, in our region. And one more comment. Um, the youth are the generation that are going to face the increase in temperature that we're already facing and all the climate disasters. Shouldn't they be um, mainstreamed in the negotiations and even in decision makers? Do you consider them to be, let's say, the 
main actor for uh, climate policies because they will be uh, directly impacted by climate change in, the, um, in this decade and more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe um, maybe let's do a, a combination. So try to answer the questions and, and reflections from each of our panelists so we can c conclude the event. Sarah, you got one directly at you. Mm -hmm. So let's start with you to, to cover that and maybe the other topics, please. Um, OK, so I'll, I'll address the question about um, from where youth can access funds and what is the current status? where are current youth that are attending the climate negotiations getting their funds from? And it's a really hard thing to say, but sadly, all the funds that are coming to youth now are coming from international community, international organizations. And let's be aware that these international organizations do as well have their agenda of what they want to see youth say or what they want to see youth uh, advocate for. Um, and sometimes the young person has to become adult to understand of where are the boundaries of what to say to the governments, what to say to these organizations, and how to not play the system, but be smart of how they're using these funds that is allowing them to go to these conferences. I think, um, sadly as well, none of the Arab organizations or the MENA region organizations are willing to put funds to send youth. So only the money is coming from international, uh, from international agencies and international organizations. And I'm not saying at heart that they have bad agenda, but they have agenda that serves their interest as a country as well as the origin uh, where this fund is coming from. So I don't say to youth don't take this fund. On the contrary, go make good relationship with these organizations, know them, talk to them, be part of them, and be smart on the way that you use this fund to serve the purpose of your country and of your principles. And I just want to say another thing to answer one of the questions that was addressed is um, we see youth participations in uh, certain uh, programs that are happening on regional levels, and I am all for it. And I totally support it. Um, I just always wish for you and agencies to ask the questions, who are they asking for these youth to come? Mm. Are they asking the government? So is it a government delegation? Or they, are they asking civil society? So is it civil society delegation or are you asking other entities? I'm not saying that government affiliated uh, individuals, um, they were, they're not best suited for these trainings, but diversify. Don't only take government entities, uh, youth representatives, look at the education sector, look at the academia, look at the civil society, yeah. diversify so you can get the conversation more forward. Thank you, Sarah. So, um, Dala. Yeah. So, um, regarding the first question on what youth uh, has to say, um, me personally, I believe the main important uh, um, um, why youth should participate in, in the climate action is not necessarily for the negotiations uh, and ought not also necessarily for these conferences that happens, but throughout the work, the continuous work of the climate uh, organization around the world are doing every day. Um, and, and by empowering these youth to join these organizations and then work, because I mean, uh, my organization working on youth and then um, the UN and, and then and in hundreds of other organizations. And it's important that they always have fresh blood coming in and saying what needs to be worked on and what needs to be done. And um, and I think this is the maybe the more important uh, part, uh, what youth has to work on for climate, not necessarily just say in the negotiations. Um, and maybe connect the second and, and, and fourth question and like how we can maybe um, uh, reach out to youth. Um, I think it's easier to to always uh, see existing networks and or organization that has already existing beneficiaries of youth that you can just uh, co collaborate with because you know at the end of the day we need to um, extend our partnerships and I, and I found this personally also like one of the easiest way to already reach people who I can trust um, and to have more impactful uh, work um, so through partnerships I would say. Um, and on the third question, um, 
and in in how you maybe uh, join uh, or um, talk to the government to establish trust. I don't believe in that we need to adapt uh, or to uh, let the, uh, go of some of our uh, beliefs or um, the way we want to advocate so we can let the government trust us. Um, they should, I mean, uh, they should trust us regardless because we have, you should stick to our demands and stick to what we want to believe in. And if they don't believe in that, then we, we're going to assert pressure some way or another. Uh, even and and that's very difficult. It's a, it's a one of the biggest challenging we having challenges in health in the region is also the political freedom that we have. Um, we yeah, are sometimes we don't really have this uh, freedom. Uh, so some some countries, of course, youth are so afraid to just protest in any uh, subject, not necessarily about environment. It's just uh, it's just the way that's happening in this region. And uh, but we need to find, to find other ways to protest. Um, through proof of work but, and, and just work with what we, what we have um, and and not necessarily uh, adapt or let go of our uh, demands. Thank you very much, Abdallah. And um, Aisha, please. Um, I think I'll be addressing both these questions uh, from, from DIWA perspective, let's say from government perspective. So you said the, the youth will be the ones facing, uh, facing this in the future. And DIWA has actually, the motto of DIWA is actually for generations to come. So when you see the organization having sustainability, uh, the vision and the mission and the motto of the entity, this is like at the forefront, this is what everyone is looking at. And it speaks uh, sustainability as an embedded culture. So when you put it as an embedded culture, um, the organizational, let's say, behavior will follow, uh, be it in, in, a technical, in a technical perspective, in a business development perspective, and not just in a mega project scale. Again, this is in your day-to-day uh, -day actions at, at the entity. And um, let's say to gain trust, um, and as Sarah mentioned, you need, you need to know who, who are you facing and, and how to convince this person. So this is why uh, submerging yourself in, in different fields, let's say, um, to not just take these, these highlight words, to, to convince them, I'm actually knowing what I'm talking about. I do have the background, I do have the, the negotiation skills to be able to convince you uh, from, let's say, different perspectives, not, again, from a technical perspective per se, from an economical perspective. Um, and this is for the climate agenda specifically. And this is uh, from sustainability being having three pillars. And again, um, anyone can do the talk, but then you need measurable outcomes. You need, you need KPIs. And this we can reflect from the Dubai Plan uh, 2021. If you actually go at, and look at the, the, the pillars, there are six pillars. But for example, when you look at the pillar of the government, you'd be shocked that one of the KPIs in the pillar of the government of the Dubai Plan 2021 is um, how much built up area of green, government green buildings you are having. So this is a very specific uh, KPI in a government, uh, let's say, plan or agenda that by seeing it from outside uh, or reading the name, you, you wouldn't expect um, the government pillar to have this specific uh, uh, thing that's related to sustainability and climate change. Uh, so when you do your research, you, you you need to find, let's say, the spider network of connectivity between the 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 plans, the visions, the missions, and and actually linking it to measurable objectives and and KPIs. Thank you very much, Aisha, for 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 your intervention. Thank you, everyone. Um, and uh, thank you very much. I'm very pleased that we had a chance to have this round of questions, which sometimes is not easy because events run over. So thank you very much to the audience for those great questions. And I think they gave us a lot of food for thought. Um, so uh, we're concluding this event. Thank you, everyone. Uh, maybe ask our colleagues back there just to put the first presentation. No, it's uh, the, the first. OK, because we have a uh, contact details there, but if, if not possible. So thank you uh, again to our speakers and presenters. This was a very lively discussion on youth climate engagement in the MENA region. And I think one clear conclusion is that youth are providers of capacity building, but they need to also to be provided the space, the platforms and the structures to be able to, to do that as effective as, as you can. So we will be posting the secretariat and uh, through the PCCB pages will be posting a recording, an outcomes article, once the recording is available, 
along with any other relevant materials on our website in the coming days. So uh, be, be, be looking for it. And uh, again, if there's any information or initiatives, I think several were mentioned, please send them to, to us so we can put them also in the capacity building portal. So that's a good vehicle for dissemination. And do yes, please do check our website for further details. Again, thank you very much. Wish you a great rest of the day and safe travel since we're the last day of the MINA Climate Week. Thank you. Thank you.